everyone. Thank you for joining the Coalition Building and Systemic Change panel featured as part of the 2020 Film Independent Forum. Film Independent and our panel today would first like to acknowledge the Tongva Tatavyam Chumash people and the traditional lamp caretakers of Tavangar, which includes Los the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands, on whose land we graciously stand. I'm Lisa Hasco, the Director of Artist Development here at Film Independent, and I'm really excited to be introducing you to these amazing and incredible artists and industry leaders who have given us their time to discuss their filmmaking careers and the collectives they have formed to represent and give voice to their communities. We had a preparation conversation yesterday in the lead up to the panel that was deeply honest and insightful. I know this discussion will be equally as meaningful and I hope it will spark conversation within the broader industry and help us move toward an anti-racist and more equitable future. Um, I'd like to introduce our amazing co-moderators and two of my favorite filmmakers and co-conspirators, Day Al Mohammed from Forward Doc and Set Hernandez, representing the Undocumented Filmmaker Collective. They'll be guiding us through the panel today, so I will turn it over to them. Thanks, Lisa. Actually, I, I think we're all pretty excited to be here, um, especially to talk about coalition building and systemic change, which I think is the core uh, of, um, of what I think a lot of the collectives face. Before we leap into this, I think one of the things we really wanted to do is actually have the panelists introduce themselves, not just as members of a collective, um, because what ha often happens, let me just be frank, for a lot of folks like us, uh, we end up being recognized by our identities and we end up being, um, um, I, I guess, referenced by our identities and by that expertise. And sometimes our own expertise within filmmaking gets lost. And so one of the things I wanted to do was give folks a chance here to kind of show off a little say, let us hear about your expertise beyond your identity. And so I think that is um, where I would like us to start. And um, I think Victoria with ADOC would be a great place to begin. Although let me pause and go, I would be horrible if I left out set. You know, I should make you go first as a co-moderator. It was either that or make him close. So okay. you, get a quick moment, you get a quick moment <laughs> to decide beginning or end. Um, I think I'll go off at the end since we already called Victoria. Excellent. So guess what, Victoria? You are it. Hi everyone, um, my name is Victoria Chalk and I am as a, a, a documentary film editor. Um, I'm British Chinese and I've been working um, in the States now for just over 10 years um, and I am an organizing member of the collective ADOC. Um, it is the Asian American Documentary Network um, and we are essentially a network uh, for people who self-identify as Asian American. Um, and we, you know, we recognize that that definition is always changing. Um, so there's lots of Pacific Islanders, people who identify not necessarily as East Asian, but South Asian, West Asian. And um, we're all about trying to uh, create, um, you know, resources for everyone, support our community and advocate for our place in the documentary film industry. Um, as an editor, I am really bad at public speaking. I'm usually in my little office, somewhat in the dark, uh, with my index cards behind me, as you can see. Um, and, you know, I love documentary film editing. I'm so much about, you know, developing characters, finding the story, um, just, like just, like ha having people sort of say their truth um, is really important to me and sort of shining a light on stories that are often marginalized. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my jam. Awesome. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, next up, I'm actually going to point to Akima Moore with Black TV and Filmmaker Collective. Well, five stars for the little brown girl who remembered to turn her mic on. 
Um, <laughs> because I'm always the one, Day. I'm always the one. Hi, everybody. I am Okima T. Moore. I am representing the Black TV and Film Collective. Um, I'm so honored to be here. I always love cohorting with my colleagues, especially those that are from various organizations, backgrounds, ethnicities, and thought patterns. Um, we don't grow if we're in the same thing every day, right? Um, as a professional, I am a producer a writer, an actor, and director. Yes, I do all of the things. Um, I try not to do them all at once. Um, <laughs> and I'm also just a human that chooses to consistently try to put the E on the end of that. Um, being humane is a choice, and it's one I try to choose every time. It ain't always easy. Y'all don't make it always easy. But we are here to do that today, so I'm so excited to be here and um, share and absorb and um and laugh and joke because Charlie nothing like a good read and a good joke <laughs> awesome thank you Akima uh next up how about uh Alex Lazarowicz with the Cousin Collective hi uh, my name is Alex Lazarowicz and I'm one of the co-founders of Cousin Collective which is an experimental indigenous led collective that um, offers support and funds to indigenous artists from around the world, not just the United States to get their projects off the ground at any stage. Um, I'm also a film director and producer and writer. And um, I just recently directed the film Fast Horse um, and I work for CBC for their hit TV show, Still Standing. Um, and that's me. Fantastic. Thank you. So set. Thank you, Day. And then I'll pivot it back to you because I think you also haven't really talked about your filmmaking work. Um, uh, thank you, Day, for the opening introduction for all of us. Hi, everyone. My name is Set Hernandez Ronquillo. They, them also use other gender-based pronouns. I am an organizer before I was a filmmaker, and I am one of the co-founders of the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, uh, along with Rahi Hassan. Uh, my practice um, in filmmaking has started off with documentary filmmaking. Victoria here is actually my OG boss, and in many ways, I am the fruit of her mentorship and love, along with PJ Raval. Um, I also serve as impact producer in a documentary space but more recently transitioning to um, writing. I'm currently part of the inaugural cohort of the Disruptors Fellowship in 5050 by 2020 and the Center for Cultural Power. And currently I'm working on a, um, on a half hour comedy. I didn't know I can write comedy until this fellowship uh, about the experience of undocumented folks. Um, and having said that, I would love for Day to also introduce herself and talk about the filmmaking work that she does. Clearly, I was super excited about this panel. I've forgotten the order of everything. I even dressed up, you know, just look, suit jacket, everything. So, you look great. Awesome. So, hi, my name is Dale Muhammad. I'm with uh, uh, a founding member of Forward Doc. I think we're probably one of the youngest organizations out there. We had our, or collectives, we had our first meeting in April of this year, and Forward Doc is um, uh, filmmakers with disabilities. And so we're actually a group of documentary filmmakers with disabilities. Uh, it's a small but mighty group. There's about a hundred of us. Um, and um, it was founded with uh, Jim Lebrecht from Crip Camp, um, uh, Lindsay Dryden in the UK, um, who uh, worked on uh, trans in America, and uh, a, a fantastic ally, uh, Alisa Namias, uh, whose film is The New Bauhaus. Uh, so it's, it's just this group of kind of coming together, and uh, we, we very much have, um, I, I guess, modeled ourselves after some of the other uh, collectives. So we looked to ADOC and Brown Girls Doc Mafia, and many of them are saying, how are you doing it? Um, and, and we saw that same need in our own community, and we said, let's take these models and, and basically uh, learn from our elders in some ways. Um, so uh, I am primarily actually a writer and came into filmmaking from writing. I, I am the, I guess, the emerging one. I just finished my first documentary, The Invalid Corps, about uh, disabled Civil War soldiers who returned to active duty and it will be screening in Maryland Public Television this fall. So I'm super jazzed about that. Woo, congratulations. Yes, they. All right. So now I think we've got the introductions out of the way. Now we get to the fun stuff, you guys. Um, so I wanted to 
just preface the conversation real quickly with the fact that uh, there's no way we're going to be able to cover everything about coalition building uh, and systemic change. And I think what um, as an audience, you're going to hear a lot about our experiences related to disequity within the filmmaking industry. But what I think we're going to try to do is actually address the fact that this comes from two arenas, which is one, which is the very individual personal experience, and then what have become like the structural barriers that are problematic that maybe aren't quite as noticeable. And so you'll, you'll kind of hear us weaving in and out of both of those uh, areas. And then what you'll also see is, is how... Um, collectivizing and working together and unifying our voices um, has been, uh, I guess you could almost say a form of self-preservation in, in how we as individuals of a variety of marginalized identities have done this. So I guess maybe the, 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 um, the, the, the first thing we might want to do, which actually I think set is up to you and it's your question to phrase, um, which is a little bit about, about um, that collectivization. Yes, thanks so much, Day. Um, and I guess as I pivot to that question um, that I'll be posing for the rest of the panelists, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. For us as undocumented immigrants, um, I personally um, am privileged to have been able to be a recipient of DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, we recognize that in the media landscape these days, uh, the stories of undocumented people are often everywhere, right? Around the news, you know, documentary filmmakers, researchers always reaching out to our communities, um, asking us to uh, divulge our stories, you know, for them. And often really to have a new project to work on, right? Um, but for undocumented filmmakers ourselves, uh, we don't often, actually always, we don't get to receive the resources to tell our own stories for ourselves. Uh, case in point is when um, uh, as a, us as undocumented filmmakers, I personally have been working on a documentary for the last five years, but when I tried to apply for a grant, um, one of the eligibility requirements for the grant from this, you know, supposedly progressive institution is that a person has to either be a resident or a citizen of the U.S. While I see all these filmmakers getting funded to tell film about my community and that they're not even from my community. And for us as filmmakers, you know, we often see our stories being told by other people while we ourselves are not being given the resources to tell, you know, our own stories. And even, you know, when it comes to um, working with filmmakers who have the resources um, to tell stories about immigrants, when we reach out to them and ask them, hey, would you be open to working with undocumented filmmakers? This happened to us, which is kind of like the catalyst as to how the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective came about. Uh, Netflix was working on a documentary um, series called Living Undocumented. Uh, they reached out to us looking for stories, you know, that we can connect them with. Um, but when we asked them, would you be open to working with an undocumented filmmaker? Their uh, response to us was, you know, uh, unfortunately, that is not an option at this moment. That's the verbatim word phrasing that they use. Not, that is not an option, meaning there were several options, right? but working with undocumented people was not one option, right? So, um, so for us, there was just like this historic lack of acknowledgement and resourcing of the films by undocumented filmmakers um, and film festivals highlighting filmmakers about undocumented uh, stories, but not our own films. So for us, we really recognize that, you know, when we come together as undocumented filmmakers, you know, that's when we start building power, right? And in the last few um, months, we've been around for about 20 months now, volunteer run, undocumented folks, uh, most of us coming from working class communities, but we recognize the power of organizing and the power of storytelling. And for us, those are really the catalysts, you know, in terms of how we've made strides in, in the field and really building solidarity and alliances with other Black, Indigenous, people of color filmmakers in the field. So um, I'd love to hear from, uh, from Okima, Victoria, um, Alex, and Day to talk about um, the work that happened and kind of like the circumstances as to why um, the different collectives that we're all part of here emerged. Whoever wants to start first. Maybe let's start off with Okima. Um, yeah, no, first of all, yes, we want your stories, but no, we don't want you. Um, so as a black woman, welcome to that. You want my rhythm and not my blues. I get it. Um, 
The Black TV and Film Collective is a collective that really provides education, resources, opportunity, and community to Black television and film uh, individuals from every level, from PA to executive. Um, aside from providing resources, we're very big on community. We think that social community, you know, social communal opportunities for our members is necessary so that people can have a place that they feel safe to kind of talk about the things that go on in the business or that they can't push through to get into the business with. Um, right now, Black is the new Black. Um, it's cute. Get your opportunities, get your coins, not mad. But, um, you know, whether it's Black, Indigenous, Latinx, LGBTQI, we've been the new Black. We've been the old Black. We've been all the things. So the fact that y'all are just catching up, you know, um, to BIPOC folks, uh, disabled individuals, et cetera, you know, I mean, y'all are late, but it's fine. Better late than never, right? Um, but for the BTFC, we consistently look to uh, link up with other Black-focused organizations, as well as other organizations that fall under the BIPOC umbrella, as well as predominantly white organizations. Because at the end of the day, our world is not predominantly just black or white or whatever else. There is a hodgepodge of all of us and the way that everybody is loving everybody, who knows what we'll all be in another 50 years. <laughs> so it's important that we are very specific about providing a home and a safe space for black creatives, but that we are not exclusion, excluding others from either coming into our space to poach us for opportunities we are more than qualified for, or to share with us, to learn with us, to learn from us, to understand us. Because I think that that's a very big thing too. Our um, fearless leader, Haria Muhammad, is amazing, a decorated producer, um, this year's Sundance Producer Award winner, amazing. She has the heart of gold out there and she has a heart for everyone, but she is fighting hard for Black creatives to be seen, heard, understood, and hired. Um, that is the biggest part. We work to make sure that people are hired. Because you can hear us, you can see us, you can claim that want to understand us, but you don't hire us. Ergo, I want your stories as undocumented individuals, but I don't want you because, you know, I can't. Insurance, e and O don't cover that. Um, so here we are. And um, for me, uh, I'm very excited that I'm in working with you all on this panel. Um, presently, I am the production manager, line producer, and post producer for PBS's Unladylike documentary series. Um, and it goes over all of the things in terms of marginalized women from each of these places, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, et cetera, Asian, et cetera. And so working on something that is so focused and diverse among unmar uh, among marginalized folks, it really reminds and rings true that we are still talking about firsts in the year of our good Beyonce 2020. Thank you so much, Okima. Vic and Alex, y'all want to chime in and share how ADOC and Cousin kind of came about? Whoever wants to go first. I mean, how do you follow Akima? <laughs> No, I mean, ADOC, um, as I was saying in the intro, um, Asian American Documentary Network was sort of born at um, the 26, 2016 Getting Real um, conversations. Um, the, the founders, uh, Leo Chang and Grace Lee, who actually collaborated together on the series Asian Americans, uh, P PBS with um, Lene Tahima Pena, who were a great, all three of them very um, important parts of ADOC, um, came together. I know Grace and Leo had been always sort of crisscrossing on each other's uh, festival paths, always trying to be, you know, the one Asian American filmmaker or film that gets into this festival and there's only a spot for one. And, and I think um, 
Grace Lee made a, a really important keynote speech that year. That sort of was the impetus of getting together. Um, I was actually pulled along to that first meeting by a director that I work with a lot, PJ Raval. Um, I think I might have snuck in, just don't tell anyone at IDA that. But um, yeah, it, 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 it was just like, just so amazing to be in this room and everyone's talking about the same issues and the same things. And um, I think it really became just like, okay, we want to do more, we want to talk more. And I think what's really interesting with ADOC is that, um, so 2016 is when we started. We now have close to 700 members. We are, um, as I said, like it's self-identifying Asian American. And again, like that definition changes and will continue to, to change. Um, but I really liked what Akima was saying about community. And I think this is where this comes in. It's, it's a network by filmmakers for filmmakers. So um, it's almost exclusively volunteer run. We try and provide community resources for established filmmakers and trying to create career sustainability. But then we also want to encourage um, students coming out of the ethnic studies program. How do we get them involved? Like, um, how do we get editors like myself talking to filmmakers and trying to really work across the film industry as a whole like funders do we have do we know who do we know in funding who can uh talk to us you know um and i think what's been really interesting is again um being able to have like just representation and take up space you know, go to a festival, okay, like we're having an ADOC sponsored event. What does that look like? We have panels now with people who look like us and it's not just one person. It's four people and they have four completely different experiences, but they are able to contribute to the same community. And I think, um, you know, we've definitely reached out and work alongside with like Firelight Media, Brown Goods Dark Mafia, coalition building isn't just building your own group and staying with your own group. You know, we're trying to work across the board. Um, ADOC members like myself are also members of Van Gogh's Dog Mafia. Uh, we work alongside um, CAM, Center of Asian American Media. Um, and so, yeah, I think it, it, it starts with ADOC and trying to find your tribe and trying to build that community. But then I think the next steps are always how do you branch out how do you find um, common ground with other collectives and start start building for the for a bigger picture that we all want to be a part of? Thank you, Victoria. And actually, the way Vic and I met is through ADOC. I'm also a member of ADOC. That's the thing. We're all like in different spaces, so um, it's super beautiful. Um, we have some TV and film with Black uh, TV and film. Uh, collective and we have documentary with ADOC. Um, Alex, you want to talk about Cousin? Yeah, that's really exciting, um, Victoria, that you were talking about community because a big part of how we started our collective um, was in 2018. Um, our co-founders, Sky Hopinka, Adam Khalil, and Adam Perone, were all, all four of us were at the Flaherty Seminar. Um, and just over beers, we were discussing about how we were the only indigenous people in that space and what that meant because the people who attend some of these higher level festivals who are invited to spaces like this are often people who set the what's cool, what's good. They're sort of setting the rules for what gets screened at festivals, what is new and upcoming, and how we were just talking about over beers, how do we get more indigenous people into this space so that they could have this experience? And that was sort of where we came out of the Flaherty seminar with an idea of, okay, we need to create a collective specifically for indigenous filmmakers who are making experimental work. And we don't have a definition of what experimental work. It can range from any sort of type of artwork. But what we were really trying to do was fill the void, because particularly in the United States, there is so little indigenous representation and most of it gets sucked into um, sort of TV uh, feature film streams instead of allowing like indigenous uh, makers to have like narrative indigenous sovereignty 
and be like really thoughtful and get the chance to choose the stories that they want to tell and try instead of trying to to set it in a white space or make it palatable for white people to understand the indigenous experience so we really wanted to set up a collective that is not so much uh based on people you know being invited to the collective or having members but a way to funnel money to indigenous makers to get their projects off the ground and have art made. And so that was really one of the big focuses we sort of led with the four of us, because we also recognized that we were really privileged filmmakers. And, you know, this was two years ago and, a, you know, like Sky has had so many awards. He's had three film screen at Sundance. Like I got lucky last year, I won at Sundance. And we were trying to figure out how we could use our privilege as four indigenous people who have gotten into the rooms kind of um, and how to invite more people into the room with us and uplift their voices. So, you know, uh, this is our first year of, of, of giving away funds to indigenous filmmakers from around the world, not just the United States. And what's interesting about indigenous filmmakers is like, we are so <laughs> spread out geographically across the world and we're not pan indigenous people. So what's unique about our stories is they are centered in the places we come from and the languages we speak and the cultures we are raised in. So I don't have the same viewpoint as someone who is from, you know, New Mexico or anywhere in Latin America um, or Alaska. And it's, so it's figuring out how we can help foster and tell those stories through their own vision and voice. And so it's really exciting because we're uplifting more indigenous makers and we funded nine projects this year, uh, Colectivo Los Invergredos, I'm gonna butcher that, I'm so sorry, uh, Raven Chacon, Olivia Camfield and Woodrow Hunt, uh, Seth Cardinal Dodging Horse, Kite, and Eve Lorraine LaFontaine, Rain Vermette and Laura Hinman and Miguel Hilari. And those are all like exciting upcoming and also like mid-career artists that maybe some people haven't heard of, but is worthwhile to seek out because their work is so incredible. And we really hope to continue this forever, hopefully. And as we grow and build with the support of Cinereach, we'll be able to offer more grants so people can make the things that they want to make and that their communities want to see. Because oftentimes our stories, and this echoes I think what all of us are saying, our stories are told <laughs> from a white lens and we are not given the opportunity to tell or participate in that type of storytelling. And, and now's the time. And I think, you know, I think all of us created and participate in these collectives because we are a bit of outsiders and we noticed that there was a space that needed to be filled. And by doing the work and by opening up these spaces and inviting people with us, like we're hopefully building a better cinema landscape for all voices around the world. Thank you, Alex. And I feel like with that white gaze often is like the homogenizing of our stories, right? And I love it how the Cousin Collective is pushing back against that, not just in terms of story, but even in terms of form, genre, and all the things. So thank you for the work that you all are doing. Um, and I'll pivot today as we, um, to talk about Forward Doc and also uh, to pivot to the next question. Sure. Um, I think I gave a, a little bit of it early on, uh, but, but literally I think when Victoria gave the story of ADOC, a lot of us had that first meeting at IDA, and I think you said yours was 2016. So we had the exact same experience in 2018. <laughs> so, so that's kind of where, where some of those same things came from. Um, and so, like I said, it's about 100 uh, folks with disabilities and allies. Um, and I think we're also real big on the idea of self-identifying. It's like if you identify as having a disability, then great because there's too many gatekeepers out there. There's too many people telling you what you can and can't be, and we don't need to be one more of those. Right. Um, and so I, I think we've got a few very specific things that we we're going that, that we want to focus on. One was increasing the visibility of filmmakers with disabilities like we're we're there. Um, and I think in 2018, that was the first time we got to see other of us all in the same room and know, hey, there's somebody like me. Um, uh, I work in the Washington, D.C. area uh, and I'm, I'm, I'd like to think I'm pretty active. I'd never seen anybody else with a visible physical disability um, in within that space. Um, and that that's really tough. Um, uh, the other was uh, to increase like the 
the access to opportunities and to networks. Um, and, and I think we've all talked about that. And, and, you know, when you're the insider versus the outsider. Um, and I love the fact that Alex gave the example of getting together over beers, because how much of filmmaking is that fact when you have the casual conversation with someone? Um, and the tough thing about disability is while efforts may be made to make the theater with a filmish screening accessible, nobody usually checks out the networking spaces um, and the spaces, those panels, those other discussions, all that informal stuff, a lot of times folks do not have access to. Um, I'll be honest, one of the very small silver linings um, from COVID has been the fact that so much um, of, of film discussion has gone online. So for many folks with disabilities who couldn't get into the door because of one step, now actually in many ways have access. Uh, I, am, I, am, I am thrilled uh, that, that Lisa Pasco and, and her crew have actually pushed to make sure that this video is captioned. Um, it makes a huge difference for our, our deaf and other disabled filmmakers. It also comes in very handy for international filmmakers as well. So this is, this, it's just smart thinking um, that's a part of that. And the last one was actually inclusion within the broader industry. And I think the tough thing is the moment someone says disability, there's a question of capacity. There's a question of, ah, can you really do that? Um, and, and, and because of that stigma, there are so many folks who are very much in that disability closet because they don't want to say that. Um, and there, there's so many um, times disabilities left out. Um, how many diversity programs? Um, if you look in the, in the uh, small print, disability is not included there. Um, if you look at some of the tax breaks for hiring uh, minority, marginalized, or underprivileged, whatever wording they choose, um, tax break, tax incentive programs, disability is excluded. Um, the recent New York one doesn't have it. I don't think the Illinois one has it. So there are several others where it's just not seen as a part of diversity. Um, and the third one, um, oh, I think, Okima, you mentioned insurance. That's the biggest one that annoys the crap out of me because they'll say, I don't know about hiring a disabled person because of insurance. I'm like, that's not how insurance works. Insurance is based on the job you do, not about you. Um, so I, oh, that, that one just drives me out of my tree. Um, so I, I think I've just kind of bulleted some of those, but I do want to hit one, which is um, really big, and I think we all hinted at it as well, which is the structure of the industry itself as a whole, of the expectations of what it takes and what it means to be a successful filmmaker. The idea is you're supposed to go in and work your way up that 12, 14, 16 hour day, and that does not make you a better filmmaker. In fact, I'm not sure it even makes very good films, but that's the expectation. And for many folks in our community, they're not going to be able to do that. They may have beautiful visions and be able to build an amazing film. Um, and Jen Brea with, with Unrest, uh, I'll tell folks to check it out, is a great example of how not following that model led to what was a very successful and very beautiful film. Um, and so I, I think, you know, that's, that's one of my big examples of, of that structural issue of how we need to rethink um, the way films, uh, the, the way we, we look at the industry. And I, I know Victoria's hinted at the one about how we can only, well, we can only have one Asian film. You know, we're, we're covered that in the ground. We only need the one black film and we're okay. And goodness knows what, oh, I forgot. There's such a thing as native films, really? Uh, and and, and, and I, you can hear my sarcasm there, but, but the fact is it's very true. And those are the things I think that need to significantly change. And those are going to be much more difficult uh, because they're ingrained into the way things work so much so that I think many people don't even realize how exclusionary they actually are. Um, although I will tell you now, at least as far as an individual point, I think everyone else can say, look around who is is in your room, who is at your table. For those of you in the audience, look around who is actually watching this and how many of your colleagues do you know who probably should but aren't. So it, it's on you in some ways to do that because we just can't carry the water for everything. Okay, wow, I, that was probably a little much. <laughs> um, couldn't resist that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that kind of, kind of I, I guess, gives you more than a little about forward doc and, and kind of what we're looking at. Um, so I actually um, uh, have, I guess, that, that next um, uh, little bit as, as Seth said, it pivoted back to me. And I think you guys have hinted a little bit about that, which was um, 
I, I would I would love it if possible. You could just give us an example of one of your experiences as a filmmaker and how that experience actually differs uh, from the experiences of, of folks in in uh, positions and identity of privilege. And we've kind of covered that a little bit, but uh, but I'll be honest. It's like we've been we've been talking here in the theoretical. You know, I want to I want to I, I hear about what makes it real. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm even willing to start. I'm like, uh, I know a fantastic filmmaker um, whose who's film won an amazing award and, and he showed up at the, at the, the theater. Um, and while the theater itself was accessible for an audience, he couldn't get on the stage beca- to get his award because it was not accessible because we are seen as subjects of documentary. We are seen as audiences of documentary. We are not seen as documentary filmmakers. And that is a very real example that, that exists now um, that, that needs m- uh, much more attention and a lot of the work. So, um, so I don't know if anyone else would has anything with regard to, to, to highlighting some of those differences in experience and some of the structural things that come from that. Um, I know for us, at least for me, a lot of the problem becomes accessibility to above the line. Mm -hmm. They will hire a black PA in a heartbeat because, you know, big, strong, here here we go with the white supremacy idea, (laughs) big, strong, strapping black guy. He can pick up all the things. He can drag all the cases. Or a black woman for crafty or catering because, you know, Mammy loves to cook. Hair and makeup. Right. And makeup because, you know, we love to be beat. Um, but getting into that space above the line or in the even bigger space, not just above the line, but decision-making. I know a lot of people that fill their below the line and laborious tasks with BIPOC folks, right? And then they don't have us in the rooms when the decisions are made. Um, I work on a lot of food competition shows and on one that I was on, they were trying to find judges for a particular food, which was like a fair food. Um, and not something, and, and, and I'm gonna sound a little crazy to some, but like not something that I know a lot of black people eat. So they were like, but it was considered a quote unquote lower brow food. They named every black comic B to C technically level actor they could think of. And I'm just listening like, but half of your hosts on this particular space like that kind of food. <laughs> Why are we taking the considerable lowbrow idea and thinking of every black human that you could to be the person for it? But nobody was, had I not been in the room, I would not have been able to say, hey guys, this might come off this way. Or, Even better, when I was working on another project and they were trying to decide um, who to use for a host, but the title and the topic and who they were looking at was so unfortunate and glaring as to be perceived as insensitive. I was like, y'all can't be, hi, hey, me, hi, I'm here. I'm an executive in this room, no. Or when I was white splange Kwanzaa. That was my favorite, that's my, I had to say that for last, was my favorite. I was trying to do a Kwanzaa installation on a platform that has and hosts a bazillion black talents. And they were, and my executive to the network for that particular platform was like, well, we don't wanna do Kwanzaa because our black offshoot doesn't acknowledge it either. And it's not celebrated on the continent. Well, duh, big dummy. The continent is Africa. They don't have to celebrate being African. We celebrate Kwanzaa in the States to talk about being from the diaspora. But all right, sir, I'm going to let you tell me about Kwanzaa, sir. So yeah, the stories are, are never ending about how we have to push for opportunity and we have to push to get in the rooms, not just to just be there, but to also ensure that we are there so our voices are heard. And honestly, I don't feel people mean anything malicious 90% of the time. There's a 10% always. But 90% of the time, I don't believe that people are being malicious with excluding us or not being sensitive to storyline and opportunity and, and language and visuals and 
and not having a way for someone with a disability, a physical disability to get on stage at an award show that you know that this person's getting an award at. I, I don't believe that they're always ups, uh, about being blatant or intentional about it, always, sometimes, but not most times, I, I will be honest. But it doesn't dispel the fact that it shouldn't happen and it's unacceptable. And if we are in the rooms where decisions are being made and the intricacies of what we need as BIPOC and disabled individuals, visual disabled or not, self-identifying disabled or undocumented, you, America is all about an immigrant story till it comes from an immigrant on camera, right? So we need to make sure that the things that we need to be visible go beyond the veil. I'm okay if the pretty tapestry is in the front, but it's the stuff and it's the messed up strings in the back that matter to ensure that picture is perfect. We are the strings in the back and we continue to be woven into this fabric called America every time they need us, but we are not here for your convenience. We are not here for your performative actions. We are not here so you can make other people think that you are in and down with us. We are not a crew. We are not a gang. We are not a clique. You cannot join us. You must represent us because we consistently built this damn place on our backs for free. We were not employed, most of us, not just black people either. Mm -hmm. And you will represent us properly because we will get in those rooms to ensure that we do, which is why I sit in those rooms to bring us all in there every time. And the BTFC offers these opportunities to learn oh. and grow in executive you shit. Me. You got me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I get passionate. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think we're all there. I think we're all there. I'm tired. I'm tired of being tired. I'm tired of being tired because y'all are tired. Sorry. Yeah. All right. I turn my mic off. So, to go off that, I mean, I definitely think that we are all wanting to see action over just the hollow words we ke we we keep getting told, right? Um, and I think that this is the moment of like reckoning. Like we need more than just words. We need more than just empty promises on how you're going to start this diversity thing or what diversity actually means. Diversity is not equity. You can have a diverse room, a diverse edit room, but when um, the people like BIPOC people, LGBTQIA, disabled people, undocumented people, when they are not in positions of equal power, mm -hmm. then diversity doesn't mean anything. So I really, I think we all want action yesterday, today. We'll put up with it today. Like if you want to give it to us today, we'll take it. But I do, yeah, I mean, on a very individual level, one, I have the extreme privilege in America of talking with a British accent. It is a privilege. Yep. People see me differently. I am biracial. Um, which means I get confused for being Latinx in LA. <laughs> I think that's just because people want to put me in a, in a box, right? Um, but I would say like personally, you know, again, the stories are just sort of never ending. When I was working with PJ Raval on a film called Call Her Ganda, a very personal, um, intimate, like documentary, about um, Jennifer Laude. She was a trans woman, um, Filipina, who was murdered by a US Marine. So there was a lot of unpacking to do there, you know. Um, we were told by a sort of high up person in funding that um, they weren't sure if that story really should be a feature length documentary. Like what, what if it was just a short film? What and it's like, well, why is it because it's a murder? Is it because there's colonization involved? Is it because this person is trans? Like, what, what, what does that mean? Like, what I really hate hearing in the documentary world well, these are little films, these are small films from small communities. Like, what is that? Like, that doesn't mean anything from someone in that community. Like, 
what to, I, I just get so frustrated with hearing that a lot in the rhetoric around funding. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you look at something in a very positive light, I just edited on Asian Americans. It was a five part series um, that was developed for a very long time before getting greenlit. Again, you have to do twice as much work to get there. And although I'm really proud of this show and proud of the team that was mostly Asian American or BIPOC that made it, uh, it was, but it was such an amazing experience for me, like creating that shorthand, not having to fight for every single thing because you know that your director agrees with you or you know that the PA who is, um, maybe Filipino and lived in Hawaii, like has actual insight that I want to listen to, that I want to know. And like, it's not about hierarchy, you know? Um, but then at the same time, that series was only five hours long for a community that has, you know, almost 200 years of history within the United States and other series of historical content get 15 hours and they're often made by a white team you know and uh, again like I want to say that it was such a beautiful experience for me but then when you look at the reality and put it into the bigger picture we're still fighting the same fight um so yeah that I guess that's my rant over (laughs) yeah I I gotta poke at you Alex because I'm sure you have a ton (laughs) of stories that you have not shared yet and 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 I definitely want to hear those Well, I think one of the most common ones um, that I think that's not just for Indigenous stories, but is that what's held against us is that you're not experienced enough and you don't have enough experience. Um, And honestly, (laughs) you start to think it's actually not because you don't have enough experience, (laughs) but because they're trying to keep you out of the room or that they're not prepared to create the community and the network that needs to support you as someone who doesn't have enough experience. And those things caught, you know, that takes time. That's, that's thinking, that's creative thinking, that's budget money, but to be able to create the support team, because ultimately filmmaking is a team sport. You don't make the film by yourself, but oftentimes, and the most common thing I've heard is lots of people who've gone into really big rooms, whether that's Netflix, whether that's Amazon, whether that's even speaking with agents, um, whether that's funding groups, and they get the response that they're just not experienced enough. And so how do you gain that experience if you have won a major award at multiple film festivals, have screened at film festivals all over the world? What do those things mean then when you hear about young guys who graduate from, say, you know, uh, New York film school and walk into a room and at age 22, they get to direct a $30 million film? And that happens all the time. And yet people who are, you know, BIPOC, LGBTQ, uh, disabled, they, the barriers that are put against them and the standards that are held against them are so high that we can't jump high enough to get there and to be given those opportunities. And like, you know, our organization, Cousin Collective, is small at this point, but it's also like I work in the world of TV and film. And it's like, you can't gain experience if you're not allowed to work on projects that are above $5 million or above $10 million or above $50 million. Until you're allowed to work on those projects, you will never be able to direct something at a higher level, which they all keep telling us they want to do. But are they giving us the opportunity to do that? No. And so what, do, what more do we have to do to get into those spaces and to be allowed to tell the stories that we want to tell? Um, and that's one of the like really frustrating things that I think that almost all of us, I don't want to speak for anybody, but have felt or heard that from somebody who is in a higher position than you and says, you just don't have enough experience. We love you. We think you're great, but you just don't have enough experience to do this right now. So, you know, go continue to be a PA or, you know, keep building your resume. And it's like, what does that mean? Um, because when you come back with the resume two, three years later, they still don't want to green light your projects. And it seems so easy for other, you know, not 
white people to walk into these spaces, have no experience and be given the helm of some huge franchise or some multi-million dollar film. And there are so many people who are, have been waiting in the wings for years and years and years and jumping through these hoops that were put in front of them and have never been given that opportunity. And what happens is those people leave the industry and some of those people are the most talented people that you want to see their films made because they're so frustrated by the barriers that are put up against them. And so then you lose a whole whack of talented people because of these restrictions. And it's like, how do we welcome and keep people into the fold? Because filmmaking is like the greatest privilege I've ever had in my life. To be able to tell films from my community, I'm the luckiest person to be able to do that and to get paid to do it and to thus be successful to do it. Like to be able to give that to other people so that they have the same opportunity that I did is such a big part of it because we want more people telling the story. I can't tell every indigenous story in the entire world. That's, I don't know the stories of, you know, people in different places than where I'm from. So a lot of the times, you know, we get emails and it's like, dude, I'm not from Alaska. I have no connection to Alaska. Why would I participate in why would I direct your film from Alaska? Like reach out to someone who has experience with that. And if you look at my CV, it says clearly where I'm from. So these things aren't difficult. It's doing the extra legwork. And I think that's the thing that comes up a lot is like people aren't doing the extra legwork because it's too much work, but we've been doing that work all along. So the onus becomes on us and we shoulder the burden um, to continue to diversify the industry that we're excluded from. Yes. Oh. Yes. Sorry. I'm like right there in the heart. Yeah. And that's, and I think that's one of the things, um, and, and not, not, not to knock, knock you guys here for hosting the, the, the panel, but that is one of the things it's, it's a, it's a panel about, uh, collectivizing and, and, and systemic inequities about diversity. Who comes to these panels? They're people who already care about the issues. We talk about the issues, but we aren't necessarily the ones who have uh, the power or allowed into the rooms to make that kind of systemic change. We'll do what we can. Um, uh, but it's the folks who aren't showing up here, um, are the ones, uh, that, that have the ability to do that. And sometimes, and you know, sometimes it's a little troubling that we get asked the questions to solve the problem. So we can't fix them. Yeah. yeah. We can't fix them. That's like painting black lives matter in the middle of a black neighborhood. It's a reminder, not a suggestion. Yeah. Put it in Soho, put it on the upper East side mm -hmm. where it's a message. So they want us oh, yeah. to be great and they want us to be make these wonderful projects, we have the capacity, but if we aren't let into the places like independent film, Sundance, the labs, the places, we can't get the tools and the skill set and the, 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 accessor the accessories, the accoutrement to make things so wonderfully big and broad and wonderful because we don't have the, we either don't have the skill set or we don't have the, the resources or we don't have the information so we just have the story and my story is great, but if I don't know how to tell it, what am I going to do? Absolutely. Do you have anything to add to this whole question and, and set? I figure I'm gonna... um, yeah, I guess I'll just um, chime in real quick in terms of experiences of undocumented filmmakers. I think often when we, there was a moment when, you know, we started to like talk to other filmmakers about the work that we're doing, you know, like all these white filmmakers coming to us, like, hey, I'm working on a film about immigrants, but no one in my team is, is immigrant. <laughs> like literally like maybe 50 white people approached us at Sundance and I was like, wow. And then um, like my, um, uh, one of our members uh, was approached by one of those very same filmmakers in the organization that they work for or the organization where they work for got approached by one of those very same filmmakers about a project that's not about immigrants, right? They did not approach the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. They know that we're here but they did not approach us about a film that's not about undocumented folks. I guess what I'm trying to say is that often for undocumented filmmakers, we're often seen just as undocumented filmmakers, right? And mm -hmm. we're only going to talk about films about undocumented people. I may, be an, uh, I may be undocumented, but I'm also Filipino. I'm also queer. I'm from the San Fernando Valley. Like, I'm a tourist. You know, like, I have so many things in my life that's going on, right? There's so many stories that I can be, um, that I can contribute to. But often I think as folks that are coming from particular identities, you know, like we're often overlooked. While white people can talk about Asian people, about the Vietnam War, about Vietnamese people, you know, about like everything, you know, 
but we often get siloed into just particular um, identities and, and not even like getting to, to explore the nuances, right? Um, I think also the, the other aspect of all of this is um, as, as filmmakers who are collectivizing and organizing, like we kind of have to split our time between our artistic practice you know, and our organizing in these spaces, right? And we can't just dedicate 100% of our time to our craft. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but I just think about like folks who don't have to worry because they're coming from places of privilege where they don't need, you know, to um, do anything to make their, you know, craft happen. You know, how much time they can just dedicate to the work that they're doing, you know? And I think, um, I think I really invite people who come from those places to like reflect on, you know, like, like we're the folks of us, those of us who are in this panel, we're often doing the heavy lifting, right? How can you kind of come out of your um, comfortable seat and take on some of this labor also, you know, and, and not just kind of go about, you know, with the status quo. I think what we're trying to do, especially 2020, you know, a pandemic, you know, a global uprising, you know, like what, what, what can people in these positions do to really make sure to get out of their comfort seats and really be in solidarity um, with the communities that they, you know, claim that they are allies of, right? Because allyship, you know, it's, it's a cute word, right? But allyship, you know, it's, it's a verb. You got to do it, you know, and what are you doing actively to make it happen? I, I just wanted to jump in, because I think you bring up a really good point is, and I think for people who are watching this panel, and if you are, say, a white person who's working on a project, bring us in at the beginning. Do not wait until the yes. end when you are trying to get funding and check the boxes, because that doesn't work anymore. I mean, it works sometimes now, but like the, 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 the landscape is changing. But also we will bring so much to your project if you invite us in on the ground level, just even when it's an idea, a formation of idea. And we can, you know, make your project better. And also we can tell you like, nah, -uh, you can't do that. You can't tell that story or that's not allowed, which does happen in a lot of indigenous communities where people walk in and say, we're gonna go in and tell a spiritual ceremonial practice that has never been filmed and there's like yes there's a reason it has never been filmed because it is not allowed because it is not a part of our culture or our ceremonial style to share stuff like this with non-people who are from our community and so I really you know putting it on the people who are watching this panel right now like if you are a white person who is in documentary you should always be trying to create allyship, whether that's through our collectives as a group or the community that you're making a film about, because they will help you guide whether it's the, the right film that you should be making. And I think that's a question that all of filmmakers have to ask themselves. Am I the right person to be telling this story? And if I'm not the right person to be telling this story, who do I have to invite in to talk with and discuss to see if I am the right person to tell this story. And that question is not being asked enough. And that's on the onus of the people who are making these films. That's also on the onus of the funders and all of the people who are the gatekeepers to the places where they take their films to and they go through the whole process of getting money, of getting training. Someone else in the room needs to be saying, why is it right for this person to be telling the story? Because if you're not right for it, you need to leave. And you need to find the person who can tell the story and help lift them up. And I think that's a part of, you know, you know, instead of, a, you know, a part of our collective is also trying to um, create spaces so that people can learn something. So what can people learn from us and trying to give guidance to, I think we had said yesterday on the other call is like, we don't want to exclude people from the conversation and point fingers and be like, I'm mad at you. Like, yeah, we're mad also, but like, this is how you can help us. And this is what you should be doing. And there are protocols and pathways that have been developed by amazing organizations around the world to create pathways to spaces you are not invited to and you are not from, but how to do it in the best way possible. Thanks. I, I just got, yes, yes, yes. Uh, sorry, and, and um, I, I think the, the biggest thing I, I thank you Alex, absolutely. And, and I just want to highlight, we started with the idea, remember I said I asked about sharing your experience, but one of the things I wanted to highlight, and I'm just going to circle back real quick, is 
every single one of those examples given, and I love the fact that I'm like, we're going to point back to the audience, like who else? This, these are structural issues. There are things that we can work on and work with you as co-conspirators and collective, but we can't solve them. You know, Okima talked about uh, giving decision-making power to folks. I'm like, that is not easy, but you have to give somebody that kind of power. That comes, have you thought about that? It's not hiring your writer for the room. It's putting them in as a showrunner, right? Um, um, uh, Victoria, you talked about funding, right? You talked about the fact that shouldn't it be a short film, the willingness to put money into into these kinds of stories because the perception is they're small stories or small communities. And the fact is, no, our stories are just as big and, and wide and dynamic as anything else. But but we have funders who aren't willing to, 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 to step into that because they say our stories aren't big enough. Um, you know, and and then and then set. Um, I, I love it. Your yours the was the your point where I, where diverse filmmakers are only useful for our identities, right? That's the only thing we're good for, or those are the only stories we we can tell, and that's absolutely not. And then and and that all of that goes to these are the kinds of things that without that 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 an industry as a whole thinks about or has within their subconscious that I'm like, you have to pay attention to. And if you want to be an active uh, ally to making a difference, you've got to be aware of that and be willing to kind of break those rules a little bit. Um, love our so, people like you love our culture. Yes. Um, and really to bring people in. And um, I think Alex's early point, um, which uh, I know we hit with hard is not enough experience is bullshit. You know, it's such a, a bullshit statement, but it happens over and over again. Uh, and then how do you expect people to be there if you're not willing to put in the supports and resources to help build them uh, to be there? Um, and, and so I want to, I want to take a, just to highlight, like, these are these structural things. These are things that, that need to happen and need to be talked about and thought about. And I'm going to actually punt to set because I'm trying to keep an eye on time. And I know he's a couple of, uh, at least one more hot question. Um, and I want to be able to give him that. Yes, thanks so much. It actually looks like we only have four minutes left for ah. the panel. So would it make sense if we pivot to the final question around, you know, what folks would like to share about, you know, um, uh, like, I guess almost like what can people, Alex kind of started us off in that uh, thread already, you know, what yes, can people do who are, uh, who, who claim to be allies actually do, right? Okima and Vic, do you all want to kind of chime into that also? Yeah, I think um, specifically, well, actually no, I think in any storytelling, I was going to say specifically documentary, but that's not the case. I think um, seeing our stories and us as people as complex and allow and that's fine you know like not always trying to simplify something so it looks like something that a white person wants to see um you know complex stories and exploring those complexities often make a better film um and then i'd also want to say to like our own communities like mentorship mentorship is so important uplifting um young activists who are wannabe filmmakers, filmmaking, filmmakers who are trying to do more activism. Like mentorship is so important when there's like mentorship, uh, fellowship things, events by institutions. Sometimes there's not even a mentor of color. So how do we uplift the people within our own communities and collectives and you know, try and bring more into the fold and like at, bring actual support um, so you can invest in someone's artistic life and career rather than just one project. For me, I'd say it's about wait. A lot of people are waiting for the change to happen. And the way that you wait is not like you're waiting for the B-52. It's as a waiter in action, in service, with a smile and customer service. Love us, love on us. Don't just love what you can take and utilize from us for your benefit, be there for us. Allyship is, a, is an action word. Show up, speak up, you know, let a, be, be a resource, be a safe space for us to say the things that make you uncomfortable and make you feel away, but also make you aware. And the only other thing I would say is, and for us in the communities, understand that you cannot be ethnocentric. It is not just about your community. It is about all of us. 
We all matter most to ourselves. That's a given. But we all matter. That should also be a given. And so we want to make sure that the, we are not we are not colonizing ourselves within our communities or other communities that fall into the BIPOC lane, wherever, whatever letter stands for you. So we have to make sure that we're taking care of each other because we have to do this together or it won't get done. The system is created the way it is to break us. So if we don't break it or just let it be and create our own, it will never be what we need it to be. Dan, Alex, do y'all want to add anything else before I kind of uh, share some to Lisa. <laughs> I think what I'd also just like to say, anyone who's BIPOC who's listening, is like, you do have the power to create your own space. Um, and that's what's really amazing about creating collectives and artist communities. You have that power. It just took four of us getting together, volunteering our time to be able to put in place something that helps and uplifts other people within our community. And that's something that I think is a really great takeaway is that you don't have to feel that you need to work in these white spaces. You can create your own space and build your own table. And there are people who are white and have money and are incredible and want to support you and really believe in it. And there are allies out there who will believe in your vision if it comes from a really incredible space. So don't be afraid to build your own table and create your own collective because it's possible. And we are still surprised that we've been able to do this in two years. So you can do the same thing. So the power is in your hands too. Day, you want to share anything further? I don't know. I, I think Alex kind of, kind of, kind of closed it out. I, I think the the biggest thing is um, the the problem with any panel is you watch it, you're inspired, you're fired up, and then you go home. And some days you're just like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Or you go home and you go, that was nice, and you forget about it. And so I think my biggest thing would be sit down, you know, make make a to-do list, you know, make a list of things you want to pay attention to, make it a, a specific thing about just small things you can do. Like, oh, I've got a grant coming up. Maybe I'll just, I'll invite this, this B, by POC person I know and have them sit on that panel or help review the grant or just get started. One small thing. Because if you don't take action, it doesn't go anywhere. And and right now, let's be honest, there are a lot of these panels and things going on right now. I don't want to I don't want to come back a year from now and have us be in the exact same space. I I, I want to talk to Akima and Alex and Victoria and and Set and Lisa and us be able to celebrate. Hey, we have seen some forward movement, um, and and we've had this before. And it's been a disappointment. So, so this is where my call to you is: do not walk away from this panel and go, "That was nice," and end it there. So, so pick one thing, do it. Thanks so much, Dave, for sharing those reflections. Victoria, Okima, and Alex, so appreciative of you all. And yes. I guess just to kind of like wrap it up, you know, in I think in Western um, Hollywood storytelling traditions, there's often this idea of one hero, right, who changes the world, you know. And I think what we realize from the work that all of these collectives, all of our collectives are doing, and in history, even in general, it's when people come together and organize and doing small things at the local level, you know, in a, in a way that's synchronistic, that we're able to make changes in a more concrete way, in the more macro level, that really has impact in the lives of our people. And to what folks have kind of shared around this idea also around um, approaching this work through the lens beyond just ourselves. I just want to close by sharing this quote by Lila Watson um, that actually she often uh, credits to um, uh, Aboriginal acti activist group uh, in Queensland in Australia. Uh, she says, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And I think in that spirit, that's kind of how we all come together um, as communities from different backgrounds, different organizing spaces, different artistic practices that we can work towards the equity that we're all fighting for. Thank you so much to our incredible panelists, to uh, my incredible co-moderator. And with that, I wanna pivot it back to Lisa to wrap it all up. Thank you. Wow, that was beautiful and passionate and humorous even. I love the fieriness of all of these conversations and I'm so inspired myself, um, you know, realizing the role that I have in this industry and the position that I have as, as a gatekeeper and what I can do to make changes um, for Film Independent and for myself personally. And it was a real honor to have you have this collection of collectives um, come together. Um, 
I'm, I, yeah, I'm really inspired and grateful. So thank you for that. And I look forward to co-conspiring with you all along the way. We're always looking for mentors. <laughs> thank you.